Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Avka. I am a PhD student at the European Molecular Biology Lab, and I'm here to talk about my add-on microscopy nodes for loading large biological volumes. And so I'm a biologist by training, and in biology, we do biology for a bunch of different reasons. We do it to understand diseases and to investigate climate change and ecodiversity, but mostly it's always just about understanding life. Um, in some way or another. So this is, for example, how we do that. We look at how a developing organism looks. So this is a parasite, and this is actually a clinically relevant parasite. This is malaria, and malaria still has 250 million cases per year. So actually understanding the life of the malaria parasite is very important, and malaria is this mosquito-borne uh, disease. And these images were made in 1880 using this microscope. And in the, since 1880, our microscopes have gotten a lot better. So the current state of malaria research looks like this. This is a malaria-infected mosquito, and this is a 3D data set. Um, and this is here. Um, so this was taken on the particle accelerator in Hamburg, and it is X-ray data. And this means that it's not just the outside of the image that we have. This is volumetric, so we can look inside of it and see the malaria developing inside the gut of the mosquito. Um, but this we can't draw as easily in our little note notebook. So we have questions of how do we really visualize this? How do we handle this? And for that, I want to talk about volumes, and specifically biological volumes. So volumes we know in Blender from uh, fire and fog, and those are grids of x, y, z positions with values. Um, and this is here shown, and this actually contains data, but we don't really see it. So if we make some of the planes transparent, uh, uh, we don't show some of the planes, we see the data inside. But this is still just a 2D representation with a big uh, block hanging off the edge of it, so we need some form of transparency. And here we do that by making all of the dark pixels transparent. And then we can kind of start to see some of the uh, strands that we kind of see here, because this is data from my lab, where we look at how worms make eggs. And this is the structures that organize the, um, the DNA in the developing egg of the worm. But then this, uh, this is monochromatic data. This is a single channel, just grayscale. But we can, of course, apply some other form of color map um, that is a scientific color map. So here we make all the dark ones purple, all the bright ones yellow. And this is actually the same color map that I applied to the um, mosquito. So this is just a really useful way to treat this single channel data and still get something really cool and pretty. Um, but not all of our data is actually monochromatic. Um, some of our data does have multiple channels in the same way that we have RGB channels in natural images. But in contrast to RGB, these don't have predefined ways of interpreting the channel. So here we have, for example, in red, a fully different measurement, which is a protein that assembles onto the chromosomes, that we, as a visualizer, can visualize in multiple different ways and really need to make that choice when we're visualizing it. And sometimes even, so I'll move this out of the way for a bit, the channels are not even other measurements, but are annotations of measurements. So here we also have the identity of each of these chromosomes that are voxel-based annotations. And sometimes this is also not enough, and we actually have a time axis. This all moves through time, and we also need to deal with that. Uh, so this is kind of part of the issue of dealing with microscopy data, is you need to have interfaces where users can easily set how to interpret all of their channels, whether something is a label mask or not. And everything is microscopy, everything is really small, and we care about how small it is. We need to have some form of scale, some way of manipulating scales. And then the last and actually most important point, this is cropped and downscaled. Our real data is much, much bigger, and we still have all of our channels, we have all of our time points. So um, we really need to deal with how large our data can get. So in the past 100 years, 200 years, we've come from these drawings of, um, uh, of 2D microscopy, and we've gone to these 3D data sets. And I think that really the way that we can now 
handle these data sets is with Blender and using the, using the capacities of Blender, not just to make these voxelized representations, but something with all the bells and whistles and all the representations that the user wants. And why Blender? Well, it's open source, which is really important to us. There's a bunch of proprietary solutions that cost a lot of money into, in our space and that are not accessible to everybody. It's very usable, especially in its animation stuff, so, and, it, uh, and all the mesh editing and stuff like this. And it's very pretty. And this is actually really important for biology, not just for, mo for communicating between biologists, but also especially communicating to the wider public. However, to come back on this usability point, for microscopy, there's still kind of some things, and that's such as these channel handling and the scales and stuff like that, and, and all of that. So I built microscopy nodes, which is an add-on that does, that actually lies in between Blender and volumetric data to kind of deal with it. So this is a panel that exists in the um, scene properties. And the first thing you kind of do in there is you load a data set. And that can be from two different formats. That's either a TIFF, which everybody has. It's a very easy format. And then OMEZR, which is this developing format that can also live on the cloud. And it has a bunch of other really neat features that I'll kind of touch upon. And this microscopy nodes will map to VDB files for volumes and Alembic files for meshes that are extracted from volumes. Then there is a scale selector. And this is actually really important. So we, our full resolution data is beautiful, but really annoying to work with. So, we can down, so microscopy nodes can automatically downsample things to under 4 gigabytes, and specifically 4 gigabytes because also the EV and viewport currently don't handle larger vo volumes. But once you've made your animation at the small scale, you can reload it at the, at the large scale throw it in cycles onto your cluster, and render everything beautifully. And this is even easier with this OMEZR data set, where you already have all of these different levels of detail saved next to each other, so you can more easily switch between. Then there is a whole part on metadata, mapping pixels to micrometers, and, and or nanometers, or Ongström, or whatever your unit is. Um, this is really relevant because people care about how large their stuff is, but this also gets read out automatically. This then generates this scale grid in, the, in your scene. That's a geometry nodes object that when you rescale it, it remains accurate physical sizes. Um, and, but this is not the only way that you can actually get scale in there. There's also a way where you map your microscopy scales directly to your Blender scales, like every micron, every Blender meter is a micron, or every Blender meter is a nanometer. And then there's the last part, which is the channel interface, um, where you can select here, for example, which colors each of your channel shall be, but you can also select how to visualize them. It can be as a volume, or as a surface, or as a label mask, where the label mask will take these separate regions and make meshes for each of them. And then you can load your data. So how this looks is here we're in Blender, and we can put in a URL of an open data set. So this is one of my uh, tutorial data sets. So you can actually follow along with this data set at home. And just once you install it from the Blend uh, microscopy nodes from the Blender extension platform, you can get it. And then here right now, we'll just load it immediately. And we'll get a little blob of data. And this is a human cell. Um, that was imaged by a friend of mine. And this doesn't look amazing yet, so we can then reload it at a higher resolution, change some of our color maps, and then it will replace our object with this new version. Um, <laughs> So what we've actually loaded is this holder with the axes, as I explained, a slice cube, which is a cube that just modulates the visibility of all the volumes. So you can rotate, scale, um, and whatever this. And you can also actually make multiple slice cubes and make an interesting array with that. And volumes. So the volumes have separate shaders for every channel um, where, you get to, uh, where you can select your min and max of all of your data. You can set your transparency, and you can um, set the color map that is selected. So right now, we are in this scientific color map, and we can right click, and then we can select from hundreds of different color maps and quickly get to another scientific color map. So now we have our data. 
uh, and in Blender, and we can do stuff with this. And what we can really do is understand life, and specifically understand microscopic life. Because I threw around some of these terms earlier of like micrometers, nanometers. It's useful to remember these things are really, really small. Um, and also, we're looking at things with novel microscopy techniques. So sometimes we're looking at things that have never before been seen by humans. So for example, here, this spaceship uh, is a microbe, is a marine microbe, so it's a plankton, um, that was caught in the wild off of the coast of uh, Sweden. And um, this is, if you compare this to a marble, this is as much smaller than the marble as the marble is to Earth. And what we can do is we can start to go into this, and then this will reveal that this is actually a dividing cell, so it's actually going through mitosis. And this is the first time this species has been seen, to, seen dividing in the wild um, ever. So that's really cool. So here we're seeing the first nucleus, and here the second nucleus that is dividing, and we can actually see the chromosomes. So these were annotated in a separate program, but then loaded as meshes into microscopy nodes using the, um, the label mask loader. Similarly, a different question that a lot of people are interested in is development. How do we go from a single cell, a single nucleus, to lots of different ones with a full body plan? And this actually requires us to do this time-based imaging where we have 3D, multiple channels, and time. And so this is a developing um, beetle embryo where we have different cells labeled in pink and cyan. And then this is imaged over 75 hours, and here we can see the body of the beetle develop inside the egg. And this is really giving us this, this, these, this gives us ways to assess these vital questions of how do we get to life, how do we, how do we answer these development questions, but also how do we, but through these kinds of visualizations, it is how do we communicate that to the wider public from our biologists. And then, the last data set I'm showing is this human cell. This is actually the same one that was in the example. Um, here in pink, we have the nucleus. And in white, we have the skeleton of the cell. So this is also the traffic network. And this is really relevant in cancer and in understanding how, all of the, how cells go wild and how they move. Um, so this, this is actually organized by two little factors that were also imaged here. Um, and so we can zoom in, and we can zoom into these uh, two factors and replace them with a procedural geometry nodes model of how we know they actually look. And this is really the power, one of the things that Blender can do for microscopy data that is not really beatable by almost any other um, visualizer is getting our models and our data to coexist in this same space. So. Microscopy nodes. It is um, available on the Blender extension platform, and I would, it is very much built for microscopists learning to use Blender for the first time, but I would also very much um, encourage you to also check it out and go through and figure out what, how all of this works, because I think it's also very interesting for Blender users, especially with these open data sets that exist now. So for this, I have uh, YouTube tutorials. Um, for uh, all parts of this, I have written tutorials. Uh, I have a scientific manuscript, uh, because this is the scientists kind of need for, to, for your CV. Um, and then there is the Image SC forum. So this is an open forum for, that all the bioimaging open source developers use um, to exchange and to have user feedback. And so you can also reach me on there for user questions. For any bug reports, you can also go to GitHub. And so currently, I'm still working on a bunch of different things, especially also after this meeting. I got a bunch of new ideas. And Blender 5 seems to be amazing for volumes. And there's like great developments. Uh, I want to think about like reworking some of how my materials work like optionally. Um, adding more annotations. So currently, we don't have the time points easily in there and stuff like this. So getting um, into more of the, comp like getting all of the annotations um, easily available for any user. 
Um, time handling, I would love a better command line interface because this is also, I'm talking to all the people who are in the science space developing 3D software and to actually be able to bridge from the open source uh, science space into the Blender space, I think is really uh, important and would be really cool. Uh, and of course, test some backend because that's always a thing you kind of need. Um, but yeah, then there is the future. And I think um, for the future, I don't exactly know where Blender will be, but I hope that will be a platform for microscopy and for microscopy analysis and visualization. I think that would be really fun. And um, then I see that I went a little bit too fast with my slides. Um, but I would like to thank everybody who uh, contributed data, which is this first group of people. Like, so the data that was shown in here, there's a lot of work to actually get to the visualization side. Uh, and my supervisors, and then a lot of people who helped me with Blender or with scientific volumes in general, especially Brady, who uh, I looked a lot of molecular nodes to figure out how to build a Blender add-on. Um, and my funding, which is all public uh, German money and European money. Um, and thank you.